Hello, I'm Professor Mike Pevy, Editor of Trends in Urology and Men's Health. My topic today is androgen deprivation therapy and its impact on men's health. We need to bear in mind, of course, that COVID has also had a big impact on prostate cancer diagnosis. And here you see UK data from the National Prostate Cancer Audit, which shows that men were more likely to be diagnosed at a more advanced stage, 21.2% versus 17.4% stage four, 2020 versus 2019, and the men were slightly older. Androgen deprivation therapy, of course, is the cornerstone of prostate cancer treatment. It includes gonadotrophin-releasing hormone agonism and antagonism, androgen receptor inhibition, and CYP17 inhibition. And I guess the important thing to remember here is that these advances in treatment had may have made a big difference to patient prognosis, which means that men are exposed to androgen deprivation therapy for longer. And in fact, the choice of treatment has become quite complex, as you see in this slide. And the majority of men, of course, are exposed to androgen deprivation therapy if they present with advanced disease. It may be intermediate localized, high risk localized, locally advanced, metastatic, hormone sensitive, or metastatic castrate, castrate resistant cancer. But all these patients will need androgen deprivation therapy to improve their prognosis. It has a big impact on men's health and quality of life. It changes how men look in terms of skin changes, hair growth, hair loss, weight gain, and sometimes weight loss. It has a big impact on sexual function, penis size, and function of the penis. Erectile dysfunction is almost universal, and difficulty also with orgasmic function and the production of semen. It in, has an impact on men's thoughts and feelings in terms of mood, libido, memory, concentration, and confidence. And most importantly, it has a big impact on cardiovascular risk factors. It increases the risk of diabetes and the metabolic syndrome and accelerates atherosclerosis. We mustn't forget, of course, the impact on muscle and bone. It has an impact on muscle strength, and tone and bone strength and fragility, which leads to more fractures. We have lots of things that we can do to improve this in terms of exercise and diet, cardiac drugs, PD5 inhibitors, and various other ways to improve erectile function, which may include vacuum devices, um, intracorporeal injections, or penile implants. In terms of cardiovascular risk, it's very important to take care of this. We know that older age is associated with diabetes, cardiovascular disease and prostate cancer. So it's not surprising how often these conditions overlap. Indeed, cardiovascular disease is the second leading cause of death in men with prostate cancer, and actually is the primary cause of death in men with T3 or lower stage disease. ADT adversely impacts cardiovascular risk factors, as I've already explained, by increasing obesity, causing insulin resistance, and having a de deleterious effect on serum lipoproteins. The loss of testosterone may increase aortic stiffness, which of course adversely affects cardiovascular risk. Testosterone may directly affect cardiac contractility, 
and lead to systemic vasodilatation. The adverse physiological effects of androgen deprivation therapy therefore may increase the risk of thromboembolic events. And there is no doubt that ADT increases arterial wall thickness, it causes endothelial dysfunction, which in turn may promote the formation of atherosclerotic plaques. And testosterone is important for the cardiovascular system. As I've explained, it causes coronary vasodilatation, it maintains plaque stability, has an antiarrhythmic effect and shortens the QT segment. Testosterone additionally has a favorable effect on body composition. And we know that in men with coronary artery disease, a low testosterone level is a marker of increased all cause and cardiovascular mortality. We need to be alert to the fact that the second line agents, abiraterone, for example, and enzalutamide, also show cardiovascular safety signals. Abiraterone can cause mineralocorticoid excess, which may induce or exacerbate hypertension, hypokalemia, and fluid retention. Enzalutamide has also been associated with hypertension. And a meta-analysis of more than 8,000 men receiving either abiraterone or enzalutamide reported an 84% increase in the risk of high-grade cardiac toxicity and more than a two-fold increase in the risk of high-grade hypertension. So we need to be alert. What we need is a multidisciplinary effort. We need a proactive approach to communicate effectively with both men and primary care doctors. We need an early assessment of cardiovascular and bone health risk factors. We need to look at multimorbidity of the patients in light of many potential complications of ADT, as I've described. It's important to discuss healthy diet, to maintain or lose weight. We need to assess physical activity and discuss maintaining muscle strength during androgen deprivation therapy. Resistance training is very important. Various sports, yoga, tai chi, etc., which will help with balance and also improve bone mineral density, muscle and cardiovascular fitness. We should consider that a diagnosis of prostate cancer is a teachable moment to improve health and be proactively involved in prostate cancer treatment. We need to keep the primary care team up to date about the androgen deprivation therapy and screen for potential cardiovascular disease and bone health risks. The ABCDE approach is very helpful. This was first uh, published by Bartia. Um, in uh, circulation in 2016, but I have amended it slightly. A stands for awareness and the importance of measuring the 10-year cardiovascular risk and considering the use of aspirin or clopidogrel where indicated in very high-risk patients or patients with already existing cardiovascular disease. Blood pressure control is critically important. Uh, drugs of choice are ACE inhibitors or angiotensin receptor blocker agents. C is for cholesterol. These patients should be offered a high intensity statin, particularly if they have pre-existing cardiovascular disease or high risk of cardiovascular disease. Cigarettes and smoking cessation, clearly very important. For diabetes, and the risk of developing diabetes, we need diet and exercise advice. For those patients with diabetes, we need good control with the use of metformin. And I think it's important to consider the new anti-diabetic agents, STLT2 inhibitors and DLP1 agonists, which not only help the patient lose weight, but have been proven to have additional cardiovascular protection benefits. The diet should be Mediterranean in style, 
and we need to be alert to vitamin D deficiency, particularly for bone health, and advise the patients to avoid excess alcohol. Exercise should be 150 minutes moderate and 70 or 75 minutes vigorous per week. And it should definitely include resistance exercise, which produces uh, my myokines, which have a beneficial effect in patients on cancer. And we must always remember to ask about sexual function because there are many ways we can improve erectile function. And if we use a PD-5 inhibitor, it will often improve the lower urinary tract symptoms as well. So a consistent multidisciplinary effort is the order of the day. And that includes all of us who manage these patients. Physical trainers can be very helpful, specialist nurses, sex therapists, and particular physicians at home, social workers, psychologists, psychiatrists, and we can always consider the use of intermittent therapy if side effects are a big problem. Hippocrates, the father of medicine, said nearly 2,400 years ago, if we could give every individual the right amount of nourishment and exercise, not too little and not too much, we would have found the safest way to health. So not all this is new, is it, by any means? And there, Mr. Chairman, I rest my case. Thank you very much for listening.